I originally began in the industry to, uh, I wanted to be a musician myself. I wanted to be on the stage. Um, and that quickly went away once I got to college and saw what real musicians were. And I knew actually before I ever went to a single class that that would not be the case. And I talked to people about ways to stay involved in the music side. Uh, but there was no degree in audio, but I found a way to work at the, at the Musical Arts Center and do recordings of shows and then get involved in the live shows and uh, to get myself to know all the people that were doing that kind of work. And then I found a professor, Tom Wood, who mentored me to make my own custom degree at Indiana University which uh, in audio engineering, and that was 1975, so there was no available degree, but now they've turned that whole thing into a music program all these years later. So that's kind of a fun twist. Um, as I became interested in doing the live sound and started touring, I was working for a Texas-based company, Shoco, but I knew that I wanted to be in San Francisco because all of the music that I wanted to be part of, the stuff that had inspired me was the San Francisco music, the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane and these kind of people. And so I struck up a relationship with FM Productions and got a job with them. And that's what inevitably led me to meeting John Meyer because he was the one who was uh, working with them, designing uh, systems for them as a speaker maker. Uh, and then when he started Meyer Sound, uh, I was already had heard the products and was interested in it and became one of the first customers specifying their gear in a club. And that started a lifelong relationship uh, starting in uh, 1979. Uh, and when the company expanded, then I saw an opportunity for me to join and close my company and join the company uh, and to do their testing. What was really, of course, a key thing was that I had road experience. I could talk to front of house engineers. I knew what their job was. I had toured. I had uh, loaded trucks. But I also was had a, a deep bench tech capability. I could measure things, I could troubleshoot circuits, all of these kind of things. So I had this very nice uh, suite of skills. And when the SIM program started, I had both the uh, analytical science side test capability and the knowing what's going on and be able to relate to people in the field capability. And that was the springboard to my going forward and becoming, uh, having SIM become the center of my life, uh, the acoustic measurement stuff. The audio experience is a, it's an auditory sensory experience, <clears throat> but it's very difficult to comprehend that experience because it's literally all in our head. And the tools that we have allow us to use our other senses, our sense of sight, to be able to help to analyze sound and to be able to understand how it's spread out over the hall, where it's going. I know where it is where I am, I can just stand there, but how is it up in the balcony? Nobody knows that. Or how is it um, going to translate later to uh, when it goes out of the studio into uh, someone's home or their car? And so for me, the analytic tools of measurement are the great, uh, great benefit that we have in my generation because we can use these things for what I call eye to ear training. We can, we can look with our eyes and see a trace and go stand there and listen with our ears. And then you link up what you see visually with what you hear. And now the next time that comes on the screen, I go, oh, I know what that sounds like from this particular picture. So I've spent a lifetime learning eye-to-ear training and teaching people how to link up the pictures on the screen, which are often ugly and terrible and horrible, to what they experience, which may or may not be uh, so ugly and terrible and horrible, but you can learn to see what are the colorations that we experience with our ears 
and then you can see that on the screen and then you know of course when to act on it wow that's that's a plate reversal or oh that's comb filtering or that's a peak that I'm going to hear sounding boom, 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 that kind of sound I can see that on a screen mm -hmm. and that's so much of my life has been dedicated to learning that well enough to be able to teach about it and write about it so that people can carry that forward and have an easier time learning it than, than I had. All of us in the sound business, whether you're doing live sound or studio or theater or whether you're in a house of worship, it's a hybrid world between the artistic expression and the scientific realities. And there are a huge number of people that can counsel you in all the things you need to know artistically for your particular set of skills, your area of expertise. But the physics are pretty much the same for all of these worlds, okay? And so anything that you learn in the world of physics helps you to understand and demystify the sound so that it's not so... Uh, mysterious and so unexpected the results that you get. So I really emphasize to people to get a focus on acoustical physics and on the way that those physics, uh, how they interact with our perception of tone, for example, and our perception of, of spatiality and reverberation, or for example, learning how your anatomy localizes uh, in the horizontal plane so that we can use delay or panning or these things to make images move left or right or in the vertical plane. You have to know both the, uh, the acoustics and the psychoacoustics because that's the bridge between your artistic world and our perception world and our physical world is in that psychoacoustic where the translation happens between physical science and artistic experience. I began writing books, oh my God, so long ago. 1997 was, well, 1994 was really the first book that I wrote. And why did I write a book? I have no, I never planned to write a book, but I wrote books because I felt like I had something to say about this subject that hadn't been said. And that's what's propelled me forward to put into, into print uh, and make accessible the, these techniques that were evolving, that I was uh, part of a team of people that helped to, to make these things become evolved and become the standards of the industry. This is the third edition right here of my book, which I am proofreading right now. It's the only actual hard copy of it in the world, because I'm going through it and fixing it. It will hopefully be out in January. The, what it is is that each time with each edition we find that the world of sound system tuning is evolving we're getting uh, better speakers and tools out there and I have to evolve the techniques to reflect it and one of the key things in my writing is I'm not writing history books I'm not writing about the way that it was I threw out everything out of the old edition even though the old edition is only four years old, if it wasn't the way we do it now. Because my feeling is you have to have this be, it's a modern cookbook for how we cook and prepare sound systems now. And so I try to make it as absolutely up to date, digital networking, uh, all the modern line array speakers, the way that we really approach this now. And um, I will continue to try to do that for uh, as long as I can. But this is a huge update. It took me a year and a half to do this. Yes, it took as long to write this third edition as it did the first edition. So it's a tremendously huge amount. There's 250 new drawings. It's a huge amount of new material because I feel like we, surprisingly, we've moved along so much faster. And these tools have become so mainstream now. When I started writing these books, it was like a, a voice in the wilderness saying, hey, look at these tools, look at these tools. Now it's like, everybody uses these tools. So it's an interesting thing to see the evolution and the widespread use of the, of the tools that are inside this book. And I'm very flattered by the fact that people uh, use it and I appreciate their support.
Um, I have been doing seminars of various sorts since 1987. Basically, uh, my seminars have been uh, pretty much, you could sum it up as saying, whatever we know now about this field is what's in the seminar. Uh, it's not a static thing, it's a constantly moving and progressing thing. It, I adapt my seminars to my audience on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I ping like a, like a sonar. I'm constantly asking questions to make sure that I keep everybody on the bus because I want to have everybody involved. But they are, it is advanced material, I will fully and readily admit, but it is, I believe, it presented in a way that people that are young and new can still find a lot in the seminar and uh, people that are veterans in the field can find a lot in the seminar. It's a very endlessly deep subject matter because of the analysis and, and treatment of sound systems is not something that's static. It it's, has all these layers. I, I like to say it's like peeling an onion. What happens when you peel an onion? You get another layer underneath and another layer underneath and each time you pull a new layer it just makes you want to cry. Okay, And that's the knowledge base of this. We go to our seminars and we just peel as many layers off as we can in order to find as much material in the days that I have. And I'll make it, it's, it's, I do seminars of all different lengths, but essentially it's the same basic subject. How to, how to, how to quantify the behavior of sound systems with measurement tools and how to design systems that can best benefit being measured and tuned with uh, these, these measurement tools. Uh, just a few years back, we had an audio engineering conference on the state of audio education, and they brought together uh, all, all these different teachers from around the world that are running audio programs, and then people that are doing audio seminars and these types of things were there as well. And we talked about the future of education and the future of sound engineering. And a really interesting thing came up in that discussion. Uh, when David Shearman went through and showed that statistically we've reached a tipping point in the industry in the last, just in the last few years where there's more money and jobs in the live side of sound than in recorded sound. There's more money in live sound than recorded sound for a whole variety of reasons, some of which are not good, piracy and you know, these kind of things, but they are very real and with us. And as a result, the live sound side of things has is, is going to have to be brought into the forefront for sound engineers to get a proper education. Because up to this point, it's easy to teach studio sound. It's like you can make a clean little place in a school, a little studio. You can teach people. It's nice, sterile, clean, simple. Teaching people live sound is a much harder thing to do. But education is critical in this thing. The modern sound engineer has to understand almost IT level of information technology networking. It's a reality that you have to know the ones and the zeros and how the sound gets there because it's no longer a case that analog is king. Analog is losing the market share, losing the market share. And in the whole history of audio, we've never seen digital give back any of the market share that it's taken. So you're going to have to learn digital networking, digital information technology, and the laws of physics, the acoustical side of it, that part is still going to stay analog. So you've got to be bilingual now, digital and analog, yeah. and that's an interesting challenge. The more education you get, the more foundation you get, the better off you're going to be in terms of your staying power and your employability. Always, of course, there's an artistic side, but that part we all find a, at least you, there's much we can learn, but we all love to learn that part because it's fun, it's sexy, it's all those great things, right? But, you know, getting your head into, uh, inside of a digital networking uh, with Wireshark and figuring out where the bits are going, <sighs> that's no fun, that doesn't inspire us, but it's what we need to know to get things, to get from point A to point B nowadays. And it's, it makes an interesting new challenge for the young engineer. Oh, a 
thank you, Catherine, for, for visiting with me today. And I'm always happy to talk to the, to the Greek sound engineers and to the uh, live uh, channel here. Um, I want to come back to Greece someday and see you. Uh, I have uh, a great love for, for Greece. It's a beautiful country and very warm people. And I hope someday to come back and visit your country. And I'd actually love to see a show there someday. That would be great fun to, uh, to experience. And maybe the acoustics of the, uh, of the Greek theater at Epidaurus or one of those great places.